officer who felt that they would be upstage if Shimon Perez came, he was not given the necessary means to attend. He subsequently wrote a very touching and moving letter that he would have loved to have participated and honor Mandela, the great man that he knows. So, as I was saying, in 2014, a terrible war broke out and the war that broke out had been had started in the West Bank. The West Bank suffered because three or two children were abducted, Israeli children, and killed. Was it of course, that gave a good excuse for Israeli Defense Force to go door to door in West Bank. And this is an untold story. And of course, Gaza got the, the headlines because planes flew to Gaza and bombarded Gaza. But the untold story, or the less known story, is that it is the people in, in West Bank, the Palestinians there, who live day to day with the IDF. And of course, when actions, maybe well intended, are taken, which provoke this type of thing, those families are the forefront. We must always remember that there are families, Palestinians, who are in the forefront, who whenever sometimes actions which are un... Ambassador, I'm going to have to stop you. No, 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 no,
this morning between 10 and 9. Subsequent to the ex this exchange, late on Thursday afternoon, the Foreign Ministry advised the Embassy that a decision has been taken to send Ms. Uh, Lee and Naidu to South Africa on an Israeli airline, LL flight LY053. And that the planned consular visit would no longer be necessary. As a nation, we are proud of Ms. Naidu for putting her life online to help those whose situation is worse than hers. That this sense of internationalism, Ubuntu, on a wider scale, is well experienced. This is the end of the statement. I will repeat, I'm a South African born and bred here. I have a right to... I think, Ambassador, you've read the statement and we appreciate no, it. No, don't, don't bulldoze me. I respect women. But don't bulldoze me. We have respected the South I'm going to give, I'm going to give, no, 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 okay. don't bulldoze me. No, 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 can we stop, can we stop that? No, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not just so good. I'm not just so good. Thank you. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Uh, Ambassador Ngobani, I'm not going to accept, I know. Ladies and gentlemen, Never. I think yeah. Ambassador Ngobani must understand that this is a pro-Palestinian event, that Leanne Naidu has been aboard the mission of the Zaytuna Oliva to break the siege of Gaza. We may also inform Ambassador Ngobani, and I have attended the United Nations in March, the UN Human Rights Council, where there is continued detention of Palestinian children, and children are living under continued uh, difficulties. So I think there's different narratives here, and Ambassador Ngomani, I accept all the narratives. Ngomani, on the record, we state that we appreciate all the consular assistance and all the assistance that the South African government ought to have afforded to a South African citizen. We are appreciative of that, but it is also a state's obligation. However, you need to understand that this is a pro-Palestinian event. This is an event of solidarity to break the siege of Gaza. And today we will not move away from welcoming Leanne Naidu. She has gone under a courageous mission together with her other colleagues. So I suggest that we accord this necessary press conference to welcoming Leanne home and asking Leanne to provide us with some of her feedback and her thoughts and, uh, and share together in that uh, moment of collective victory. Thank you. side of this conflict you're on, and I think you were trying to speak about that, but these people have, these are my comrades and family, they haven't seen me, so I think they really would like me to talk, but it's not necessarily to silence you, and we, we managed to talk a bit on the way from the plane, and I do understand it's a difficult situation for you as well. Thank you. I don't know how long people have. Because I was on a boat for a very long time. Um, okay, but I would like everyone to be able to listen. Um, I don't know how long people have, so I'm going to try and make it as short as possible and people can ask questions afterwards. Uh, firstly, it was very, very um, overwhelming to be given the opportunity to do this. Prior to going, I really had a sense that it was an important thing for South Africa to contribute to. It was also very difficult for me at this particular historical moment to leave South Africa, to leave my student and worker comrades. I've received very little news because we've been out of um, communication about the terrible struggle that's been happening, the very violent struggle that's been happening, 
at universities. So to start by saying it was a difficult um, decision to go and leave our struggles, but it is true that we have had a kind of reset in 1994. We have a huge responsibility to take ourselves in a different direction. It's very clear speaking to um, other activists who've been part of the struggle to free Palestine, that this is a struggle that's been going on for 70 years. They haven't had reset. It is like going back in time um, when, you, when you engage with the Israeli state, which I can speak to a little bit later. But I just want to draw to attention that even as struggles are difficult in South Africa at the moment, we did have a, a momentary reset. And it might not have been the best thing, and it's certainly not the only thing. We have a long way to go. But the people of Palestine and the people um, who continue to defend brutally uh, the idea of Israel have not had a reset. They're in this struggle for 70 years. So the, the, the discussions, the debates, the fighting is so much worse than what we are doing over here. So I just want to start by saying, by acknowledging our situation in relation to theirs. Um, I want to thank everyone who worked actually for a year. In some ways, I had an easy part. I, I left here two weeks ago. Um, but there are many, many main women, not only, but mainly women, who raised funds uh, through, from what I understand from the WhatsApp group that was very busy, almost as busy as the FISMAS full WhatsApp groups. It really was a long, hard slog to raise money to be part of a solidarity campaign, and that was done largely through people, individuals, showing solidarity, understanding from afar that the situation in Israel-Palestine and the situation of occupied Palestine and occupied West Bank cannot continue. It is 2016, and we really need to figure out flotillas are fantastic, but we also need to figure out more forms of solidarity, because it cannot be that that situation uh, persists in the way that it, it, it exists. So firstly, thank you to everyone who worked behind the scenes, who are in fact more important. Um, I've managed to meet some of you, not all of you. I hope I'll meet the rest of you um, now that I'm back. Um, also to just acknowledge the 13 other women who were on the Zaytuna, and then the many more who actually didn't get to go, which in itself was a terrible situation. Uh, for reasons un, um, unknown to all of us, uh, specifically, two boats were not able to sail. So we started out with two boats. Um, the Amal didn't leave Barcelona for technical reasons, and that meant that the group of 25 women had to be cut down to a group of 13, which was a very hard thing to do, because many people had prepared themselves mentally, emotionally, physically to go on that journey. Um, fortunately, through the, the international solidarity, another boat was purchased, and by the time it got to Messina, where I joined the mission, um, there were again two boats potentially leaving um, for Gaza and within 24 hours it became apparent again that the second ship was not going to, for various reasons, be able to sail. And again we had a situation where people needed to choose who would go. Um, so I want to acknowledge all those women who took time out and were going to go and didn't get a chance to go. Um, they would have gone home, hopefully inspired to come back and do it again or to continue from afar. And then the 13 women who were on the, the uh, Zaytuna, of those 13 women there were three crew, um, a captain uh, from Australia who's been on very many Greenpeace actions. Um, she's a very strong woman and that is why she's able to be an all-vessel captain. It meant that we had a tight ship that was quite um, challenging for a lot of us. It was very necessary that we had someone who was both uh, very skilled in, in sailing, but also had understood how to be arrested, how to, I mean, she's done some crazy things like throw people in shipping nets, so the people who are whaling or who are fishing decide either to continue fishing or to save the people in the nets. So she was very much prepared to do what, um, what needed to happen. And then we had two fairly young, the only the two people younger than me on the ship were a sailor woman, who, um, who helped um, make sure that we survived the little squall, which I'll tell you about later, but some harsh conditions uh, on the sea. And then we had two Al Jazeera journalists who um, managed to report live, I don't know how many of you saw, and also managed to do package sends every day, trying to get 
as much of the message out from the boat as possible. Um, and they did a fantastic job as well. Um, in very trying conditions, wobbly boats and big waves. And so if they are listening um, to, to say a, a big shout out to them, we didn't get to say goodbye to them because when we, were, when we uh, got onto land, uh, the emission was pretty much over because all their cameras were taken, so they left that evening and didn't see them again. We didn't get to say goodbye, so hopefully they hear this. Um, and then of the seven participants, um, I would like to say especially to the Malaysian delegate and the Algerian delegate who both do not have consular representation in Israel, they went there knowing that there wasn't going to be any government help. Um, we think the government wanted, their governments wanted to help the Israelis would not allow <coughs> it. They were also the two women who, who wear hijabs and who are very easily identifiable as Muslim and um, they surely understand that what that meant. I understood better what that meant once we were in Israeli um, captivity, I suppose. Um, so I want to um, say really hats off to them because they put themselves in a, in a hell of a situation. And then um, two other delegates who were 72 and 74, that they managed to be on that boat, um, the Nobel laureate from, um, from Ireland got very, very sick, but she was very clear that she was going to be on that boat and that she was going to take her message of solidarity and peace and hope uh, to Gaza and had been, in fact, four times prior, has been deported four times from Israel. In one of the detention centers that we were at just before we left, we were lying on the back of a, the bottom of a double bunk, and there was her name from 2009 <laughs> with a whole lot of other names. So we were, I was very fortunate to be amongst um, really brave and amazing women. Um, we also had a, um, a Maori parliamentarian from New Zealand. Um, it is, it's quite uh, heartwarming to hear how the indigenous people of um, the Maori indigenous and other people from that area have been regrouping in ways that felt very similar to the decolonized conversations that I've been having with um, student comrades. Um, so it was really good to be in conversation with people from around the world who are, strangely enough, fighting over similar things, fighting over land, fighting over justice, fighting over the fact that indigenous people continue to be brutalized, not only here, but in an, a number of places around the world. Um, also, the American, our team, our boat leader is a, was a lieutenant in the American um, military. She's 70 plus years old, Mary Ann Wright. She's also been on a number of missions um, she has worked in the military and I think stopped around the Iraqi war and so has spent a lot of time going around the world, North, South Korea, you name it, wherever there's violence, uh, she has been going and taking the message of dialogue and peace, um, which was important to be around for me, especially in this moment where in South Africa it seems that um, we are sitting on the cusp of hopefully for in a number of directions and not simply returning to one where the path will continue to use the state machinery to repress dissent. So there were a number of amazing women on that boat. The journey itself was, um, I think it's in solidarity. I think we really need to reach out um, more consistently with the technology we have, have conversations and learn from people in different parts of the world because we're not going through things on our own. There are many, many people who are struggling. Um, we managed to speak to Gaza via satellite phone a couple of times. Oh, I must also um, mention that um, Dr. Fozio, who's from Malaysia, medical doctor, um, when she was telling us her um, experience and her struggle and solidarity with the people of occupied Palestine, she has started three and some various programs to make sure that the, all the operations that take 120 days, they are waiting, crazy waiting lists in Gaza. I mean, we, we don't even need to go over the facts. We know how bad it is there. But that this uh, doctor from Malaysia on this boat spends a lot of her time 
Besides delivering babies and in her private practice, she has started a number of NGOs. She could um, phone officers in Gaza and speak to people because she is that, her solidarity is that rooted in the place. So there were different kinds of people bringing different kinds of messages and support and solidarity um, to the people of Gaza. So, I mean, I really have a lot to say about this, but I don't want to bore everybody. Um, I'll speak just a little bit about um, it was uh, personally important to go on this mission. Um, everyone kept asking, wh why, where do you connect to Palestine? Why do you connect uh, to the struggle so strongly? Of course, as many of you could have also honored, uh, apartheid is something we know well. And um, Israeli apartheid is it's kind of taken from the handbook in some ways. There are so many similarities. And I think probably the key difference, besides the religious element which adds to the, the struggle, is that we are in 2016 and military technology technology has, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically apartheid on speed. Um, in the sense that the, the possibility to be brutal is amplified so much because of the amount of money and power and military technology that exists over there. But then having been there, I've never been to Israel before, having been there for, I don't even know how many hours it was because we were woken up and put to sleep so many times that I don't, I can't, maybe 36 hours that we were actually on land. It became very apparent that even though technology helps to suppress people and oppress people, the very basic ways that one dehumanizes someone is the ways that happen to us under apartheid. It's, it's about um, insisting that people believe that they are different from one another, that some people are more, more superior than others, that some people have more choice. Sometimes that's just by luck, being born <laughs> a couple of kilometers on the wrong side of the fence, which many of you will know. Um, so the demonization is not, it's amplified by technology, but it's the same system. It's a system of forcing people to expose themselves, both physically by doing strip searches um, and by de dehumanizing you um, in ways that don't require lots of money. Um, we all know the past system is very much alive there. The thing that was confusing for me was that the oppressor looks like the oppressed. I, I was very confused by that because in South Africa it was very clear who the oppressor was and who the oppressed were. And over there that's not true. You can't see who's who, except if people are wearing scarves and hijabs. So the dehumanization in fact, very simple. It's a case of locking people up, stopping your movement, questioning you and cross-questioning you as if you are a terrorist. Or as if you come to very clear that that is not this, that this is a peaceful boat with a woman. And that we, all we're doing is taking a message of solidarity to a devastated place. Even when you do that, when you're on the wrong side of this, you are the enemy. And I just kept reminding myself, and let me say up front, if you saw the images that the idea would have put out, it would have been the images and the story that they want you to see. And to be honest with you, what we went through was what Palestinians go through. We were treated very well. Wow. And that was primarily because we were clear that we were going peacefully. We also had media attention. And with those two um, uh, lines of communication, really, one to the world and one to the people who are holding the guns, they, they can afford you a little bit of humanity because you are not challenging them at all. And so it makes complete sense to me that they would have behaved the way they did towards us because it would have been a very bad um, decision of theirs to do anything else. It would have been terrible if they behaved like they did to the Turkish ship. 
Military shot from helicopters with ammunition and then went on board and executed people. So this is a, um, it's a, it's a conflict and a space that has technology that really confuses people. So if you would have seen the images, you would have seen the Navy personnel boarding our ship. I don't even know how many things people saw. I don't know what. Everyone has a GoPro. So they have their story from every, and they can edit it exactly the way they want to. The minute they boarded our, well, before we saw the naval ships on the horizon, our satellites were cut. We could send no more messages, no more images about what we were feeling about what was going on. So this te technological warfare around who communicates what the story is, is a, uh, I mean, it's one that the David and Goliath story is not, it doesn't even capture it. So we were treated much, much better um, than any Palestinian or even Jewish person who would have said, we're coming not necessarily in peace. We're not going to let you stop us. We're going to go forward. Those people would have received much harsher treatment than us. Um, and then just very briefly, the... I think the, the, this, when we got to 32 miles out, they, they've been watching us all the time about that. I can speak another time about some of the other stuff on the boat, which is really important, but when they decided that we were no longer going to be talking to the rest of you and they were going to come and stop us, I mean, four, four huge military ships on the horizon and um, the radio communication which we hoped to record but we, we couldn't because they took everything we um, we the captain, the captain they try, we tried to have a conversation with them and say so everyone who says dialogue works dialogue works for the people who own the guns man we tried and we said to them we don't have guns we don't have food or money to take it's not a humanitarian um, boat or is going to take hope to a devastated place. Surely you cannot argue against taking hope to a devastated place. Like, in terms of the law, we all know the apartheid law. Law gives you the right to do some fucking crazy things. In terms of the apartheid law, we will not allow you to break this blockade. We like, we one ship, 15 years long, 13 women. We've told you everything. You've seen it on the news. You know who we are. Why would you stop us from taking a message of hope to a devastated place? Our orders are to do this. We will board you. I mean, at first, before they were talking about boarding us, they were using very um, broad language about we will have to use force against you. And when you're sitting in a little boat and you see these military things, you wonder if that's not just a tornado. All your communications are off. You don't actually know what they mean. And you do know that when they say they will use force, they have used uh, deadly force in the past. Uh, fortunately, that wasn't our case, and I think that had a lot to do with all of you at home watching. Uh, they understood that that was um, happening. And so we had the, we had these young kids, 20-year-olds, board us with these, this, these Robocop equipments that we see our own riot police <coughs> in. It's devastating for them that these young kids, that's what they go into. They come onto that ship and they scare us. They're going to hurt them. They don't know how to respond. And so we respond in a way where we try to, and it's conflictual for me, because I understand that going and saying, please listen to us, please let us do, it doesn't work with the people who own the guns and have the power. So there's a part of me that feels like we, we failed, because we didn't reach Gaza and people were waiting. I don't even know about this other bombing stuff. I'm hoping that's not in the last few days. I mean, it's on the same day, at the same moment as it was being intercepted. While the women were standing on the shores waiting for you, waving their flags. See, I don't even know all of this yet. And the thing is, those kids on that boat, we had seven hours. That's all it takes to get anywhere on an old boat that only goes, whatever, six miles an hour. Um, and when we were on the boat, one of the things we did do... Um, one of the crew members is a music teacher, and she had a guitar with her. And so she, uh, in conversation with the rest of us, um, 
wrote a song about what we were doing. And um, after a couple of hours, I mean, the first thing was they on board. They brought uh, picnic bags because that's apparently what they do with missions that have um, media. And they put the picnic bags down and started unpacking and saying, are you hungry? Yes, I'm started with water and then started with falafel and other things. Um, the bread. Um, and, you know, in that moment, I said to the, we were told that we shouldn't speak because if you antagonize them, even in a little way, and you scare them, they will become violent towards you and that we need to speak through our boat leader and our captain, which was very hard for all of us, obviously. Um, because we were all, uh, we were all active women who wanted to say something, but we'd agreed that that wouldn't happen. But in the moment, it was very clear. Once they boarded our boat, they kept their zodiac. It's called zodiac. Like Star Wars in boats that can move very quickly, that have guns and lasers, and about eight people on board. About eight of them got on board. Not about eight of them got on board. Four women and four men. I mean, the average age was 21, I think, of the people, but two senior people. And the, the Zodiac stayed next to us, taking pictures and video of whatever interaction happened, where somebody smiled or someone looked relaxed. Because that was the story that they wanted to tell. Very strongly to see one or two of I was actually the crew, or not necessarily activists, happily take the chocolate mousse and start eating it and be photographed. It was a really hard moment because that was a moment that we hadn't discussed. And um, basically, uh, listen, I don't eat Israeli products at home. I'm about to start eating it here. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and then, I mean, it's pretty clear that they worked who the ones were that they sorry, who, 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 oh my god, my guys. <laughs> Can you get the back without this thing? Okay. If I cry again, this is not going to get Okay. Um, so, there's a, it was a really hard moment to see how when you, when you are occupied, as we were in our boat for a few hours, you're always gone. And I mean, when, when the hand that feeds you is the hand that moves you as, as well, it's a really, it's a messed up situation. So, we had seven hours on the boat with these young people who were behaving, who were treating us fairly well. Um, from Algeria. These were people, the, the Spanish delegate were clear they weren't going to eat the oh, um, PDS. But other people also, that's not their form of solidarity. So it was hard to be a unit and then recognize that actually many of us disagree on some things. Um, I'll just share two more moments from the boat, you guys. Um, uh, the one was, at some point we were getting really tired, it was dark and we wanted to sing. And uh, there were one or two songs that the ship knew and then we had been practicing and you can go and see it on YouTube. I think two or three of the women sang it and recorded it and uploaded it. It's a beautiful song about 13 of us. And you go to Gaza with a message of hope and saying that we will keep coming back and we won't be silent until the people of occupied Palestine are free. And so what we say is let's play some music, let's play some songs and let's do the song that we did. And we were singing and then we sang the Palestinian song and of course the there were a few people who were just who were by, and um, we pretty much heard what we were singing, didn't say anything, and there was one uh, soldier who we later found out her grandparents are from Morocco, and one of the elders 
journalist is a Moroccan living in the UK and they, were, they were, had a conversation and um, another one a guy who loves music apparently suggested that we sing a song together and a lot of people will go oh that's so kitsch like sitting on a boat singing a song with these soldiers who are actually you know acting on behalf of a legitimate or government uh, but we couldn't figure out a song to sing together um, and, and, and strangely enough, everyone on the boat knew that song, even the Muslim um, comrades. And we sang the song, and it was a confusing and I mean, beautiful human moment with, with these young people who were singing with us. They didn't want to be there, some of them necessarily raising us. A lot of them don't want to be in the army, they don't have a choice. It was very clear that the one woman, the only one who, who took food, uh, we had our own food as well. She's the only one who took a cup of tea from, from us. So it's a, it's a devastating situation on both sides. Of course, we can't, we can't count up because we know where the power lies. And that's really, and that's not the point I'm making. But that was a moment that was really confusing and I think maybe important for one or two of those soldiers to feel like there could be something else, they could do something else. The second one, which was the hardest moment of the entire trip for me, when we were getting closer to Ashtar, uh, because it was dark, you could see the lights. And um, some of the ones who had been on the before, the ones that had actually made it in 2008, I think, in 2009, we all stood up. 